Kenju Hira. Sada je sve u redu. Ok, welcome all, welcome to our speakers, welcome to participants. My name is Ricardo Gutierrez, I'm the General Secretary of the European Federation of Journalists. As you may know, the European Federation of Journalists is the main representative organization for journalists in Europe. We represent 300,000 journalists in 44 countries in Europe. Continental Europe, I would say, the Council of Europe, the zone covered by the Council of Europe. And for us, we decided to to focus on photojournalism in the framework of this particular project, which is project because we we feel that. There is more and more concern that particular exercise of type of journalism. Posebne vrste novinarstva, da je tako nazovemo. European platform reporting media freedom violations. Council of Europe platform for the protection of journalism and another platform launched by the European press. Uh, and uh, Media Freedom Center in, in, in Leipzig. And, and we know uh, increase of cases of photojournalists, you know. Uh, uh, of, uh, intimidation. Law enforcement. Uh, uh, but also from citizens, uh, demonstrations uh, during the demonstrations. Hey, Ricardo, you... can I interrupt you? I think there's yeah, something please. wrong with the interpretations. Can I please ask the interpreter to go to your interpretation channel? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. In but English? Uh, in but, this is in Montenegro. In Montenegro. Yes, but also because uh, my um, the English is uh, it's off, so that I can hear you. Everybody can hear you. Could you uh, go to your interpretation channel? Yes, of course. So, would you like me to mute original audio and to listen to English channel? Yes, because I think everybody can hear. Yeah, we are not supposed to hear you. <laughs> okay, so now? Uh, say some words, maybe. Okay, it seems it's okay. Is everything no. okay now? Can you hear me? No, we can still hear you. Uh, I muted the original audio, and now I'm uh, uh, listening to English channel. I'm listening to English channel and translating into Montenegrin. Could you go uh, go out and come back again? Um, Sorry, you can I cannot oh, hear you. Could you go out and sign in uh, as an interpreter again? Because I think you are signed in as as a participant, maybe. Or maybe I could ask. Can host do that change? Maybe I could also ask for those people who are present who really need a Montenegrin interpretations because um, I don't want to delay it further. So maybe we could begin to uh, continue in English until the problem is resolved. If you really uh, need Montenegro interpretations, uh, please let me know now. If not, we can continue to, to use English until uh, we have resolved the problem with the interpretations uh, technical problem. Ricardo, maybe you could continue. Okay, and uh, so without any interpretation or we go ahead? In any case, yeah. okay, let's go ahead. So I was telling you that uh, photojournalism became a, a real issue, a real concern for uh, uh, the European Federation of Journalists, but also most of the uh, European uh, 
journalist organizations, you know, um, associations and, and trade unions. Um, a few years ago, we, we, we had the uh, first case of uh, killing uh, of a, a photojournalist. It was in Turkey, uh, our colleague Mustafa Kambaz. Uh, he was killed. Um, he died of, of a gunshot due, while, while he, he was covering uh, the attempted uh, coup in, in Istanbul. Um, and we faced, uh, since that uh, particular event, more and more cases of journalists, photojournalists being harassed, uh, intimidated, and so on, uh, on the ground. Uh, we also know that uh, it was mentioned by uh, our colleague Yanis, uh, uh, the, the digital context uh, allows anybody uh, to post uh, pictures of uh, any, any event. So it's, it's also challenging for uh, photojournalists to, um, to continue to do their work. There is an issue with the working conditions of uh, these um, journalists. There is an issue with the, the safety of these uh, journalists. And that's why we, we decided to dedicate uh, this uh, seminar to um, photojournalism and, and mainly the problem of um, safety. Uh, just to be very brief, um, my advice to, to our participants uh, we, we know that it's really important to report cases. So if you face in, in your daily work um, any kind of uh, violation, it, it could be a, a simple intimidation or, or physical threats, uh, please record it. Please um, contact your uh, journalist organization, it could be a trade union, an association, please contact uh, the police and, and the judicial authorities. We really believe that it's, it's becoming really important for uh, any of you um, to, uh, to report these cases because we, we feel that many cases are not reported and there is a, uh, an underestimation of the, the real problem. So, it's in a way an act of solidarity from yourself to report uh, any case or to convince uh, your, your colleagues when they face such uh, threats to, to report uh, the case. So that's, that's a, a very important um, advice from our federation. Uh, the other one is to you know, um, keep this issue uh, high in, in the agenda. Uh, that means that uh, we should cover as well as journalists these cases, you know, to report about these cases also in our media reports or like we are uh, doing it today uh, by discussing it uh, with colleagues uh, at the professional level and the level of professional organizations. It, it's a way, uh, you know, to inform, to keep it, you know, uh, high in, in, in the agenda. Um, and also to exchange good practices, uh, uh, how, how to react um, when you face uh, such, uh, such threats. So um, I expect also uh, all of you, uh, mainly the participants, uh, of course, also the speakers, to interact. Uh, I think it, it would be important to, to have a strong interaction. So as you plan uh, told you, uh, please use the Q&A uh, chat, but do not hesitate after the presentation, after the, uh, the sessions to, to raise your hand. Uh, we will give you the floor. I think it's really important to have a, a real and strong interaction between you uh, because it will feed us as well as a journalist uh, organization. We need to hear your real concerns, your daily concerns, and it's really important for us as well uh, to know what you uh, what you face in in daily work. Thank you to all, and um, I wish you a very fruitful uh, debate uh, seminar. And um, I don't know, you can if you can introduce the, the the next speaker or the next session. Thank you all again. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, so thank you, as Ricardo said um, uh, rightly, um, the reason behind the organization of photojournalism. And uh, this is actually a part of the two-year projects um, that launched by EFJ um, 
on uh, quality and trust in the media. And this is the fifth series of our webinar um, focusing on really photojournalism in the whole changes in the media industry and the impact specifically on photojournalists. So this uh, webinar is organized um, in cooperation with our member in Montenegro, the trade union of uh, Montenegrin journalists. So I would now pass the floor to um, the vice president of the union, uh, Radamir, who will share some um, thought about these issues and the situation also in Montenegro. Thank you. You are on mute. Thank you. You can hear me now. Uh, so dear participants, dear colleagues, thank you for the opportunity to open this online seminar and Tell you something more uh, about situation with photo journalists in, in my country, in Montenegro. My name is Radomir Kračković. I'm vice president of trade union of uh, media of uh, Montenegro. And at the beginning, just a uh, briefly introduction uh, of our organization. It was founded uh, only eight years ago, but at the moment we have uh, 600 members and we are the, the largest uh, media organization in uh, Montenegro. Uh, we gather uh, journalists, but also uh, the photojournalists and uh, other technical staff in media. And uh, uh, as uh, in other countries, I, I suppose, uh, in my country, media are very polarized, but we are unique because we have uh, members from, from both sides. Uh, our main goals are protection of uh, working rights of journalists, uh, fight for a better economic status and, uh, and the fight for professional standards and generally better uh, media environment in Montenegro. Uh, talking about uh, photo journalism in Montenegro is not easy uh, because uh, this is one profession which goes to extinction in, in my country, according to my uh, colleagues, photojournalists, but uh, more about that, you will hear from my colleague Boris Pejovic uh, on uh, tomorrow's uh, session. But generally, uh, photojournalists in Montenegro face um, many challenges in a digital era. Uh, uh, photojournalism is very important uh, for a journalistic profession, but in uh, Montenegro, uh, this fact is often ignored. So uh, photojournalists are put on the background, which further jeopardize their rights. Uh, photography in Montenegro is generally seen as something secondary in, in uh, journalism, although it is sometimes more important than the script, uh, uh, especially when reporting about some uh, turbulent events. And in Montenegro, we have had a lot of, of, of uh, such kind of events uh, in recent years. Uh, additionally, the, the salaries of photojournalists are lower uh, than uh, uh, those of journalists in Montenegro, but lower uh, than uh, the salaries on the national uh, level. Uh, and uh, this is one more reason uh, why their status is uh, quite bad uh, uh, in the relation to the countries uh, from the region, uh, for example, Serbia or Croatia, uh, not to mention European Union or, or United States. Uh, and with, uh, with the development of new technologies for photography and also with the expansion of uh, social networks, uh, there is an increasing violation of copyright of photojournalists in Montenegro. Uh, for many media in Montenegro, it's much easier just to, to quit for photojournalists and steal photos from the uh, internet and uh, uh, many media outlets uh, do that in uh, Montenegro. Uh, so uh, when we have uh, all, all these uh, facts, uh, we also have a data that uh, uh, 
the number of photo reporters in Montenegro decreased in uh, recent years uh, by 50 percent and uh, many photojournalists were forced to to change their uh, profession and, and do do uh, some uh, other uh, job uh, and uh, our colleagues uh, learned that uh, the the job of photojournalists is dying out in in Montenegro. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have a big expansion of digital of number of digital media in Montenegro. I, I mean portals. So we are a very uh, small country, but we have uh, about one hundred uh, web, web portals in Montenegro, and but just few of them have engaged uh, photojournalists. So so they they steal uh, photos from from uh, other uh, media, which is a big. Uh, problem. Uh, another problem uh, during pandemic uh, for photojournalists uh, were the decision of uh, government of Montenegro and some other institution to prevent uh, photojournalists from uh, attending events, press conferences, uh, etc., in order to to avoid crowds and contagion. But at the same time. Uh, journalists uh, were invited and they reported uh, from from these from these events uh, so uh, it's obvious uh, from uh, my point that there is an uh, urgent need to to educate the public and the media in in montenegro about the importance of uh, photojournalists uh, uh, also, the, the copyright must be uh, respected uh, if continue uh, like this. Many media in Montenegro would face uh, lawsuits and high costs uh, because they, they continue to, to steal photos. Uh, at the moment, there, there are no so many uh, lawsuits, so it's difficult also for, for photojournalists to provide uh, adequate representation before before the court for uh, their uh, lawsuits. Uh, all in all, uh, our organization, Trade Union of Media of Montenegro, will will continue uh, to work uh, to improve the the status of photojournalists in uh, Montenegro, but also uh, to educate the the public about the importance of uh, photography as an uh, uh, authentic journalistic uh, expression. Uh, I believe that uh, could be our common fight because uh, I believe that uh, there are also some other countries that face uh, the similar problems as photojournalists in Montenegro. So this would be from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Radomir, for uh, actually outlined actually the key points that we will discuss in the next panel and also uh, tomorrow. Um, and I'm sure all these problems also other country face similar problem and issues um, on this. So uh, I would like to introduce um, to now to go to our next panel. But before that, I would like to apologize for the last minute change as one of our speaker in the coming panel um, would not be able to make it. So in our panel, uh, we have uh, two uh, speaker, Lars Bauer and Anna Gordon. So in this panel, we will really discuss also um, uh, the, the changes in the photojournalism and how the changes in the whole industry have impact on the journal, uh, on photojournalists and what other cha challenges, but also um, opportunities so I would like to introduce our two um, speaker, Lars Bauer, who is the director of the European Journalism Center, um, but he already have been involving in the industry um, for many, many years. Um, and he has a uh, lot of uh, different hats in his previous job and have been always been working with the photojournalists. And then the other speaker, Anna Gordon, is a very experienced um, British um, photojournalist. And uh, she has uh, worked in, in the industry for a long time and seeing a lot of changes uh, in the industry. She works for a lot of um, British media organization, but also some NGO charity um, 
uh, organizations. So I would like to uh, give the floor to both of you, maybe from uh, Lars first. Maybe you could share with us a bit more about mm -hmm. yourself and how you come into contact with the photojournalism industry and also um, your work um, in this area. Is there, is there possible to raise a question to the speaker? Yes, for the questions, we will have uh, plenty of time later on for you to ask questions. And uh, you can um, raise it by raising your hand when we have uh, when we come to the Q&A sessions, or you can put it in the chats. So I would like to ask you to, to mute your mic for the time being and let the speaker um, say something. Um, and then I will open the Q&A uh, when, when, um, when it's done. Thank you. Last. Thank you, Yuklan, uh, very much. And thank you for having me on this panel uh, because it's a topic that is very dear to me. I will keep my introduction short so we have lots of time to talk about things and uh, ask questions. I, I've been involved in photography at large for, for a long, long time. I've also been involved with art. Uh, my career started at the Art Foundation in Amsterdam. Um, and uh, that's where I got into touch with photography and where we need not just bought art photography but all kinds of photography including photojournalistic work or documentary photography and um, after that i i uh, started working uh, in a gallery selling photography with uh, some some well-known names not not so known names jonas bendixson or name a few also uh, focusing on uh, photography with a story and I, uh, I also became the director of the Dutch Photographers Federation, which is now the Dutch uh, Photographers Dufo, merging all of them into a strong uh, association um, and uh, working together with the uh, photojournalists in the Netherlands, the, uh, the NVA, NVF. Um, and then uh, I, I ran the World Press Photo Foundation for five years, which I stopped uh, last summer. Um, turning it into an organization that went beyond photojournalism and more into visual journalism, as I call it, because multimedia productions, all kinds of ways to tell uh, stories with visuals is now part of this landscape. It's not just about the photo anymore. It's about much of these things. I've always put up a fight for, for photography, copyright issues. Uh, I know a lot about lots of things. And uh, but I'm not a specialist in anything, but I think that applies to all of us since this landscape is changing so much. Now, recently, I started as the director of the European uh, Journalism Center, who is a training institute uh, developing, supporting and strengthening journalism at large. And I hope to uh, contribute more there with visual journalism uh, as much as uh, as it is with focusing on on uh, on uh, text. Um, but what I see there is beautiful productions that come out of the grants that we hand over through the work uh, we do with many philanthropic uh, organizations. And, and much of that work is a great combination of text and visuals and uh, presented in an equal way. Uh, so for me, uh, that continues in this long line of, of working with, uh, with photography. And I also work individually with photographers. Sometimes because I like them, sometimes I feel that it's worth the stories that I want to share. And there I focus a lot on uh, business models, monetizing your work, uh, which is uh, quite easy if you do it well and if you find your, your strength and your audience and if you, if you treat your, your business side uh, very well. So maybe there will be some time during the panel also to talk about that. So yeah, that's my introduction. Thank you, Lars. And Anna? Hello. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, firstly, I'd just like to say it's very exciting from Britain to be involved in something European again. So that's wonderful for me. Um, I am a press photographer. I've been working in the UK, for the, mainly in the UK, for the last 20 years. And I trained on a group of local newspapers, which used to be, in this country anyway, the traditional route into photojournalism, which meant that you didn't have to go out and buy your own equipment. You were given equipment and you were given training. And it also meant you got a very good grounding because you covered everything from sport to news and arts and features. So it was a wonderful way to learn. 
Um, and then after doing that for about two and a half years, I started freelancing for more national and global news organisations, which is what I've been doing for the last 18 years, um, mainly in the UK. And it's been fantastic. It's something I'm very passionate about. I love storytelling. I love adventures, meeting people. And it's a wonderful excuse to be let in to all different kinds of places. Thank you, Anna, for the introductions. So I think both of you touch upon, uh, you both have a very uh, common, really passionate about um, the industry. So um, with these changes also uh, already highlighted by Ricardo and Radomir, also I, I just want to see your personal view or also according to your own experience, how you see the future of photojournalism under these uh, influences, under these changes? Do you see uh, uh, opportunities or you see more worry? Is the, is the industry really like uh, our colleague Radomir saying like dying out, really facing a lot of competitions? And so um, if you have this crystal ball in front of you, so what do you see? What is uh, the picture that you are seeing uh, from yourself? Maybe from Anna, you first? Um, okay, the death of photojournalism is something that's been predicted since I began in the industry and I don't, I didn't believe it then and I don't believe it now. I think there is a huge demand for photojournalism and I think there are ways to monetize it. I just think that we have to be creative and adaptable. Um, the biggest changes I've seen in the last 20 years as well as the advertising money going from media organizations into places like YouTube and Google moving online, so there are much smaller budgets, have been the rise of the wire agencies. And a lot of those in the UK at least pay very low day rates and they insist on keeping the copyright of your photography. So, and they obviously supply the images to a, a wide range of places. So there are less photographers covering things. Um, yeah, I think we just have to be adaptable and nimble. I think that it's very difficult to just make your money from photojournalism completely and you have to diversify, um, not necessarily out of photography, but maybe to different markets and clients as well. Um, but I think there's hope and there's big organizations that are giving people grants and funding to fund different stories and photojournalism. And I also think the subscription models of newspapers are finally becoming profitable. So that um, industry is also turning around. Thank you, Anna. And last, what do you see in the crystal ball? Yeah, there's two things always. There's trends and there's forecasting. That's the crystal ball. Trends uh, are always difficult because uh, yeah, never marry a trend. It's a short-lived marriage. Uh, but what I see very often is that we run toward trends and we think that this is the new solution or that is the new solution or this might be the new solution. If I look to the future, then I look at a very bright future because uh, if you are a specialist in imagery, which photographers should be, then there is more demand for visuals than ever before. The whole world has become a very visual place um, and, and it's, it might be very easy to monetize on these visuals. We've started to uh, read and write only a couple of hundred years ago, maybe three, four hundred years before that nobody was able to read and write, uh, except for the monks or uh, some people that uh, mastered it. But visuals have been part of our uh, system uh, ever since we uh, dwelled in caves. So we're much more fine-tuned to visuals. And visuals are something that takes a, a huge place on the screen-based world that we live. Uh, including what Anna has called uh, media shifting to, to screen and, and away from paper. Um, so I, 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 there's all kinds of reasons to be optimistic. Um, the, the problem is, of course, that we try to move from the existing business model uh, to a, uh, a new business model, whatever that business model is. And we just have to accept that this uh, new reality does not allow the same amount of uh, space of making money in the old ways as before. 
but I, however, see lots of uh, visual storytellers that also uh, work in journalism, but also tell stories for other organizations that, that is, they, they are dear to them, are able to make money in a very um, uh, uh, overlapping way. Uh, if you only want to make money from uh, photography that you would sell to a media organization or an image bank, then I don't believe that it's going to work. It is already not working right now, except if you are in a very privileged uh, position. Um, so our goal should be to look at new ways of making money. And there comes the joy of, uh, of digital. Uh, digital allows you to, uh, to enter into the audience in such an easy way that it's your task and your, your uh, means to an end to make sure that you build up your own audience. If you are able to do that, then you can monetize on that uh, any way that you want to. Very commercially driven, or you can do it also in a way that it's uh, not commercially driven, but at least makes you a living. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Lars. So you mentioned about um, there's increasing in demand and a new opportunity for photojournalists to venture into. Um, but also, on the other hand, there are also an increasing competition from non-professional uh, photographer, let's say, to compete with um, the, the professional photojournalists. And how do, how do you make sure, um, you know, as a photojournalist, your work stand out and sell, and also sell a, a decent price so that you can make a living um, out of it? As Anna also mentioned about the needs to diversify your, your, your sources of revenue. And I know most photojournalists, you know, they start to work as a passion. So it's sometimes it's quite difficult to marry passions with business model. So I just, uh, yeah. So how, how do you, uh, and also maybe start from Anna, how do you reconcile these passions and business uh, side of, of your work? And how do you make sure that you could continue your passion, passion by you know, earning a de decent living out of it? Um, well, the way that I've done it personally is I tend to look at jobs in terms of paying a lot of money or being interesting. And I try and have a balance between those two things. So some jobs pay for me to do more interesting work. Some jobs are more corporate and maybe not so interesting. But with the money I earn from that, then I can do some more journalism, more storytelling and more interesting work. Um, but I, I, there's a huge demand for imagery are coming from, you know, I think most organizations now when they're doing something recognize that they have to have high quality images. And I think that's a way that most non professional photographers can't compete because there's a lot of terrible, terrible photography out there. Um, and I don't think it's good enough for most organizations to use uh, And uh, in the UK at any, any rate, I think that's broadly recognized that there are some things we can't compete with. I think if someone is at the scene and there's a breaking news story, I, I think you know that the quality isn't necessarily so important in those cases. Thanks, Lars. I, I don't believe. I don't. I I resist this story of uh, competition with uh, with amateurs. Amateurs are not in the market to make money, but they enjoy their passion. Passion uh, with uh, professional creative we get for free. If you're not passionate, I don't want to work with you because then you're just an uh, automatic uh, photo maker. Right. So this talk about passion, passion is uh, very often the quote of somebody else. Oh, I'm so passionate. Uh, passion doesn't make you a living. Passion makes you enjoy what you do. If you're passionate about photojournalism, then you will do it. And I know many of your colleagues that do it no matter what uh, and still make a little bit of money, but make, make it work and, and feel very uh, privileged and, and uh, honored, but also, let's say, happy to do it. As Anna said, of course, when there's something happens on the street and somebody snaps a photo, then, then uh, you can never beat that. But maybe you should think about yourself as uh, I am not in that competition anymore to beat imagery mm -hmm. like that. Because with uh, what we formerly called the phone, 
uh, everybody can record in 4K. And if an, a volcano erupts, we will never be there the first. I believe that the word photojournalist should focus a lot on journalists and not on photo. That photo that is a given. You anybody can become, become a photographer, and it's super easy to become a photographer. And it's also super easy to become a decent photographer these days. But if you focus on journalism, which is following a certain set of uh, rules as we have defined them now then you will always beat that person that is walking in the street who's never able to, to do that. Of course, you need to translate that into working for journalistic medium or create your own medium uh, to, to do it. But journalism is much more important than, uh, than uh, the photo part of it. Um, and, and if you are good at it, and if you know that there's demand for your stories and your photography, then, then, uh, then you should be able to make a living. You also should combine it with other things. Uh, there are things like print sales or speaking engagements or uh, presenting your work on a festival where more and more these festivals start moving also in the territory where they uh, remunerate photographers for their work or invite them over for the network. So um, every, you know, the, the, the market is huge, but it's also available for everybody. So the only way that you can uh, stand out is on, on uh, value creation, that you are creating something that is more valuable than the others and that you also treat yourself uh, like that. And with that becomes uh, the business side of your work. And I will always say, uh, uh, act as think as a business person don't act like one yeah thank you Lars for for this useful comment I think it's quite difficult to to do <laughs> it's a uh, as I, I I go on I can see a relevant questions for for now from the chats uh, from Natasha um, the the National Union of Journalists from National U Union of Journalists. So um, her questions for uh, should amateurs not ask for payment? Uh, okay, let me a concern a concern in National Union of Journalists Photographers Council is often clients get used to taking free pictures from non professionals and not necessity understanding the qualitative difference. So should amateurs not also ask for payment? The NUJ has had a long running campaign on a use it for use it pay it for it. So. Um, can uh, Anna or Lars answer this question? I think this is related to monetizing uh, your work and also how to counter the competition. Mm. Anna, do you want to go first? Um, yeah, I think newspapers should pay for images that they use. Mm -hmm. And people should ask for, for money. Yeah. Can I say something, uh, Yuk? Uh... Can I say uh, a few words? Yes, you can ask some questions. I would like to say something, not ask a question. I would like to say that uh, even if 100 people are taking with a picture with a cellular phone of an incident, there is no substitute to a, a, a press uh, a prof professional photographer. And so it is our duty as union first to give a practical help in securing uh, 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 the rights of the, of the photographer is copyright. And second, to, to pass the message in every respectable newspaper and news organization, you have to have a professional um, photographer who does not uh, turn the camera to the liking of any party, any interest, but the journalistic interest. And I do believe that this profession will continue to live. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for raising this important point um, about the roles of uh, trade union. And I think uh, our colleague from the NUJ posted some kind of guidelines also on the fees um, for, for photographers. But this question, we will be ha have a more deeper discussions for tomorrow on this. Um, so I would like to go back to Lars answering the question from um, our NUJ colleague about um, asking for, for fees as uh, amateurs. 
Well, I, I think the theory about uh, that they should pay is very nice, but in the reality, it will not happen because they don't have to. Um, and you can't make them forced to do it. It should be their responsibility, of course, in media. And you should have uh, mindful people there that think uh, about these things. But an amateur very often doesn't want to be paid, except for the fact that he or she uh, gets the image into a medium that, uh, that uh, he or she admires. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm all about copyright and I'm all about that people should be paid for their work. Uh, but again, we should not be in competition with amateurs. Uh, we should be uh, working on the highest level. And uh, I don't think that we should waste our energy on uh, battling off amateurs. We will never win. There are more amateur photographers out there than there are professionals. Uh, but there are not many professional, there's not many photographers out there that can work on a professional level, right? Everybody can make a photo, but to be a professional photographer takes uh, a lot of extra things uh, combined to it. And, and very often you see also that when amateur photographers want to become professional, they fail because they start to understand it's not about uh, the photos. It's also about who you are and what you do, what you stand for. Um, yeah, so talking to media about the fact that, you sh that they should pay for imagery is, is, is always good, but nobody can force them to do it. And unfortunately, uh, we will also see that the difference between not paying for photography and cheap photography is very, very small. Photography has become very, very uh, cheap. Uh, and, and I'm not talking about the value of uh, the, the image created, but about the money that is paid for it per photo. Some image uh, banks pay two euros for a photo and uh, very often you still have to share it as well you get 50 percent um, so because of that it's also easy for media to go for photography that is very uh, inexpensive and i think there there's a, a world to win to make sure that photography is not being almost given away at a low rate um, because then everybody starts to work on volume instead of uniqueness yeah. Thanks, Lars, uh, for, for the answer. Um, I have a, another question from the NUJ colleague. I think that's really related to also what we will next dis discuss about on the issue about gender and diversity. So I will also to really uh, move on to this. How do you both, having um, worked uh, in the industry and worked with um, other photojournalists, colleagues in the industry, how do you feel about the diversity in the photojournalism industry? and um, to both the content, the images itself, and also the people who are taking the picture themselves really reflect a diversity in society. Are we still seeing the same whole story about, you know, Western male, um, middle age uh, in this picture, in the news reporting, or do we see some improvement? Um, can you share your, your view and also your experience in this area? Anna, maybe, maybe you can uh, go first because also uh, I can also um, post this question from the NUJ Cody about asking for, for payment uh, for, the, for the photos. Um, and the question is, uh, do you think women photojournalists are often less? And I think this also links to, 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 the, to the question about diversity and the value that uh, you created in relation to your personal gender or even um, um, ethnicity. Um, yes, diversity in the photojournalism industry is absolutely appalling. Um, and I think there's been a very small amount of change, but not a huge amount of change. Um, according to the State of News Photography, which was a report that came out in 2018 um, from a survey from entrance to the World Press Photo competition, women, female photojournalists were about 20% and less than 1% of entrants identified themselves as people of colour, um, black, as black photographers, which is, I mean, in world photography is absolutely crazy. Um, and I think because of this, certain imagery is, is valued and certain stories are told. And I think as a business model, it's very important that diversity comes into the industry as well as for ethical reasons and the fact that we're all humans in this world and we need to hear 
and see more than one point of view. I think things are very slowly starting to change, but there's also a very aggressive response to when you even mention these things. You, there is a backlash, people don't want to hear it. Um, so I think our industry has a huge way to go. Um, I think it would be really helpful if um, big agencies release numbers on the gender and race of people that they hire. I mean, I know these things are difficult. I mean, women photograph have started releasing the data on the photographers that take the A1 front page images. And that's really, really interesting and really depressing. Thanks. Yeah, we the, uh, the photo world is very good at talking about external threats and very, uh, very bad at talking about internal threats, which one of them is diversity. It's absolutely appalling and disgusting how this, uh, this, this distribution is. Um, the, the position of uh, women in photography uh, needs to change and should change and not because uh, it's not just one reason. There's, uh, if, you, if you tell stories of, uh, about the world through journalism, photojournalism, then it's also important who is telling that. And it's also important what, what it is about. So besides um, the, the divide between male and female, there's also the divide about uh, the, the privileged and the less privileged. So uh, while that is raging through uh, journalism and photojournalism, some people refuse to, to even look at it. And um, I've always spoken out in the report and I uh, talked about that was part of my effort to make it more transparent at World Press Photo. We need to have numbers to make sure that we can take a look at it. And if we don't know the numbers behind it, there's no way to find any direction uh, into change. I'm very uh, hopeful and positive about the changes uh, that are taking place. It's going slow, but it's certainly there. And it will not go away because it's reaching a, a majority of people in the industry that are, uh, uh, they, they know that this, is, uh, this needs to change and, and it, it should change. Uh, with all these changes, which is always difficult, there's always people pushing back, whether it's openly or not openly. Uh, as I told you in this introduction, when we talked about uh, preparing this, this session, uh, even me and, and some of my male colleagues that have spoken out and even have acted, have even been threatened uh, and, uh, and harassed for it. I don't care. So if people watch, I don't care. Uh, I'm not afraid for that, but it shows that within the photojournalism world, which is uh, talking very highly about ethics and ways how we should treat our subject or ourselves or how we should treat the business, um, we should also be aware that there's a lot of people in there that uh, don't necessarily uh, think like that or certainly don't act like that. Yeah, so... Um, I also believe that for future, uh, uh, the business of, uh, for the future of uh, photojournalism, uh, there will be no businesses or media in the future that will accept a, uh, a business that is not diverse or inclusive. I mean, it's, that is also changing a lot. So for us, it is uh, necessary to, to, to go with these changes and uh, put in an effort to make sure that, uh, that this changes. Yeah. Thank Can you. I add something yeah. else? Sorry. Yeah. There's, there's a very strange phenomena. I don't know if it's just in the UK or if it's globally, but here we have more women studying photography than men. And but when it goes out into the industry, it drops down to 20%. So something crazy is, is happening mm. in that bit of time. So I think it would be really interesting to, to look into that as well. Yeah, it's, it's a global phenomenon. Um, and uh, it's not that it drops to 20% because that number of world press photos is not always representative to the industry. But what you can see is that, uh, that very often uh, the amount uh, going into photography is, is uh, quite high from education. But then in the business side, it's, it's, it's very often it drops out. Um, and it has multiple uh, backgrounds. I mean... Uh, uh, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not afraid to speak out, but uh, it is very known that uh, uh, women 
are not so good in negotiations as men are. Men are more bold and let's do this and uh, here we go uh, so that we can teach each other to, to be better at it or we can uh, set, uh, apply a set of rules. But it also has to do with uh, parenthood. When female photographers become a mother, they very often are sidelined really sidelined oh you're 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 pregnant so then i can't send you out on a photojournalism assignment anymore i mean this is ridiculous it is so old-fashioned uh even the, that you think that that's going on that's that's uh, that's straight strange it still happens and uh, of course by talking about it it becomes less but it's a it's a global phenomenon that uh more female students in photo uh education but in the business it doesn't reflect uh, so yeah. Yeah. Thank you for, for also this critical view. Uh, as you mentioned, there are some cha changes um, definitely needed and there are some changes within the photojournalist uh, community. But I just wonder also what about outside of the, the photojournalism committee about the audience? Do audience or do you know, do you have information about or data that do audience want such changes? They want to see something different, not really the same old thing. Um, do you know whether the audience uh, are ready or are asking for such changes? Yes, they are voting with their feet, which is a saying that they are walking away. And if they are walking away, your problem only becomes bigger because traditional media, newspaper, uh, especially paper, is only being looked at by uh, uh, people of my age and above. I'm uh, in the 50s. I'm, uh, yeah, I, I look young, but I am older. Um, that's a joke. Um, so people vote with their feet. Um, and that means not just that audience. So my, my kids are also looking into media and they, they of course, they, they look at stories. But what is also happening is that people that don't feel represented in the stories, that they don't feel talked about, they will not connect to the journalism that we are displaying right now. There's numerous uh, research about that. How can you uh, find your audience if you speak to the audience in a way that they don't necessarily relate to or don't even understand or don't want to be a part of anymore? So that's, that is very clear that if you... If you don't make these changes, you will not win your audience and you will lose your audience. Um, so by, uh, yeah, by, by, I, I would say that the audience is, is, uh, is, is making very clear in that way that uh, they want uh, different kinds of imagery. They want different kinds of stories and they want a diverse and inclusive uh, storytelling to come towards them so they can relate to it and can understand what it's about. I know you have something to add. Or? Yeah, it's, it's very similar. I think I think people want to see stories that they can relate to about things that they care about. And I think this is different for different groups of people and different individual people. And if just one group of people are deciding what's important and telling the stories, then you're missing out on everyone else and they go elsewhere. They're not so interested. I, I also, I, if I may, uh, uh, there's a question of Felix about uh, the, the strengthening of journalism part in photojournalism. He says, is the rates for pictures, if he's going lower and lower, is there an option to lobby for paying the, for the work in the form of day rates? Well, um, for me, this is connected to an audience, right? The, photo the audience is not interested in pictures. Maybe sometimes there are some remarkable pictures out there. I, uh, do we talk about pictures or photos? Right? Uh, a picture is what I do and a photo is something you make. That's your craft. Um, I think people are not so much interested in a single photo. They are interested in your story. Journalism is telling a story into depth, into the richest way possible. And um, so I believe that uh, strengthening the journalism part is strengthening that storytelling part. And storytelling can be, uh, uh, can be something uh, that you make up. But in journalism, you're not about making up the story. You're telling the story uh, according to a, a quite a strict set of rules, ethics, uh, everything, no uh, manipulation of the imagery. So what I see is that uh, there is a lot of money being paid for good visual stories with some 
photographers that you've probably not never have heard about, but we will never hear from them about complaining about money because they are being paid very high fees, are being hired for very high uh, amounts of uh, money uh, because they have this added value of uh, uh, creating a story in a journalistic way, telling the stories that will reach a, a large audience. Um, they also happen to be pleasant people to work with, which is uh, something that is very necessary if you're in the business. You know, people don't like to work with bad uh, people. They want to work with people that are pleasant, uh, professional, uh, able to solve some problems. So money, making money in photojournalism is always the problem for the one that doesn't make it. It's not the problem for the ones that are successful. And there's so many successful stories out there that we can't keep up this story as if the, the industry is dying. Because if nobody would make any money anymore, then the business is dead. But what I see, and I know many of them that are making uh, substantial amounts of money, also investing a lot of that money into new stories, that I, I find it always very difficult to, to talk about uh, as if the, the business of photography is not working anymore. While I can see that there are uh, great examples of where it does work. And I can, I can share easy some of these examples with you to highlight the ways of making money beyond uh, media and beyond uh, the ones that give you the assignment. Thanks, Lars, for, for the tips. Uh, I think uh, people will be interested to know, um, but we have time for you to raise questions in the chat box or, or you raise your questions um, requesting for the mic. So as we are talking about the issue about gender and um, a lot, you also mentioned about uh, how uh, for female photojournalists do uh, bargaining um, for, for the price is also very important. So I have a question for Anna. So you have been in industry for a long, long time, and I'm sure you have uh, a lot of experience as a female journalist um, in a very male-dominated industry. So um, can you share with us some kind of challenges or barriers that you have uh, your, yourself encountered and how you overcome this issue and probably also use your own um, identity as a female photojournalist, uh, you know, the edge to be different and see things differently through your photographer and sell it in a different way, how you see it uh, according to your experience on this. Um, okay. Um, as a female photojournalist, I think you feel very other a lot of the time because you're in, especially if you're in a press pack in the UK, there are like one or two female photographers and everyone else is male um, and white, normally, pretty much everyone else. So you feel very different in a lot of situations which is not necessarily a bad thing but it can be quite intimidating sometimes um i think training in local news was very very helpful because then you're used to working on your own and independently anyway um i think one of the biggest issues is there is a lot of bias conscious and unconscious among commissioning editors and so you get very early on you get people suggesting that you don't really want to go into news, that you be much happier in features, um, trying to push you, push you into sort of softer news stories. And this kind of idea of a safe pair of hands where they'd be much happier, sometimes unconsciously, you know, just sending a, a big man there basically, because they feel like they'll be able to handle the situation. Um, I know of some jobs that I haven't been assigned because of my gender. Um, I mean, I've heard several times as well, including last week actually in a meeting um, where someone suggested that the reason for the small number of female photographers were because we couldn't carry the equipment. And I've heard that from at least three different male photographers. And I've heard not directly, but from some big editors who think that, you know, we, we can carry babies that are much heavier than cameras, but for some reason, cameras are, are difficult for us to carry. Um, and I just think that 
yeah speaking out about it you get a lot of vitriol and a, a lot of people don't like it and so I've had a lot of online and in person um hatred from speaking up about these issues um but hopefully things are starting to change and people in the wider industry and people that are looking at the business of the industry and see that we can't just have one viewpoint are seeing that, that things need to change. Um, sometimes I think it has been an advantage in that people can relate to you and feel possibly safer and not so intimidated um, being a female photographer. I mean, that, but I guess that could be a personality thing as well. Um, and as Lars said, motherhood makes it very, very difficult. I've got two children, um, taking maternity leave, trying to explain to editors that you wanted more than a week off was very, very difficult. A lot of clients I lost when I took maternity leave. Um, and I took five months off each time, which in the UK is, is not very long. Um, and the world of childcare and the world of photojournalism are almost completely opposite. You know, child minders, I, and it, it's very, very expensive to have people look after your children all the time because you don't know when you're working, where you're working, what time you're gonna start, what time you're gonna finish, but it is possible and I'm done it and I'm still here. So there is hope. Thanks, Anna, for, for such a positive note um, and also sharing with us a lot of challenge. And obviously also the other challenge, um, it's also what you just mentioned briefly about some kind of uh, attacks on you also because you brought up the issues, but also as a, a female photojournalist. And this we will talk about or more tomorrow really about the safety of photojournalists in particular female journalists, um, how to ensure the safety and, and the different child safety challenges that they, they face, uh, such as a harassment or uh, online and offline uh, that uh, I'm sure that most of you are quite familiar with that. I just have a question from the chat box uh, commenting. I don't know if the question or a comment, but mention about also photographer, um, how many photographers they hire are disabled to. So I think this is also add to a different dimension of the diversity debate, not just about race, gender, but also um, uh, disability issues, because uh, we always underestimate human being that we can, you can do everything despite you know, what kind of background or, or physical ability that you have. So I don't know if uh, any of you have come across that uh, this issue, but I guess this is also an issue that very much less talk about in the industry about disabled journalists or disabled photojournalists. I always use the example of Giles Dooley, who lost uh, three of his limbs in Afghanistan and is working and uh, now uh, also uh, in his own foundation, uh, active, active uh, arguing against uh, war. Giles Dooley, uh, if you find his, his lectures on his work, it's, it's remarkable. I mean, uh, just before the Taliban took over Afghanistan, he was in Afghanistan with uh, as a, a triple amputee still working so yeah there's uh, there's certainly examples of uh, disabled photographers but it's very difficult as as it is in general in society where uh, where uh, people with disadvantages uh, need uh, more support um yeah but uh, uh i see a question about statistics about it i i they are not there are no statistics about this uh, maybe there should be, but uh, I think it's only anecdotal that we can find these stories uh, about it. Uh, in, in general, the problem in journalism, photojournalism, is that there's not many research done. Uh, that's why for lots of people always go back to the report of World Press Photo, which only reflects the ones that participate. Um, and uh, I can see that World Press Photo, after that I've left, we started uh, talking about diversity and inclusivity about it. Now their whole, uh, their whole new strategy is focusing actually on that, which is very nice to see. And I'm hopeful uh, that this will play out in a good way. And I think it's also quite well received. 
Um, but the world press photo should not be the measure of things. It has been for a long time the measure of things, but most often uh, we we speak about it now that it reflects what photojournalism uh, was, and not what it should be. It always reflects what we have produced in the year before, and not about what is produced now. And I think there's lots of organizations also focusing on what should be produced now and and where to work uh, work against. Um, so many challenges, um, I would say, uh, uh, even the division in Europe. Uh, and I am happy to be seeing uh, photographers from Montenegro or anything out, out of the region where Montenegro is, because the advantage for photographers in Germany, France, uh, the Netherlands are even are still far more uh, better than, uh, than, uh, than the ones uh, in Montenegro or Slovenia uh, or any of the countries surrounding it, um, which also shows that uh, even within Europe, uh, this, this, uh, this challenge is there. Yeah. Thanks. Maybe I can ask uh, if anybody in the audience have more questions, uh, you can either raise your hand or put in your question in the chat box. In the meantime, um, uh, we talk about a lot about uh, the issue on diversity gender, and we mentioned a little bit about barriers, um, issues entering into the profession. So, um, as, as you know yourself, um, uh, well, first you're passionate about the subject, but also um, nowadays we, we mentioned about a lot of in the digital area that photojournalists can venture into, but obviously it will require a lot of investment on equipment. And we all know that um, the professional um, camera is not cheap. And also um, sometimes they're also quite heavy. Uh, also all this, um, how do you see that is the industry still kind of like limited as to present quite a lot of barriers for for young or new photojournalists to enter into um especially for photojournalists from different backgrounds like female also from a different um, ethnicity background or even disabled so how do you see these uh, barriers or can it be also overcome how do we how do you know aspiring um, future uh, photojournalists can you know overcome this barrier to to enter the industry? I I think there are very there are no barriers to enter this industry, which is uh, not good news for many of us, but good news for the ones that want to get in. Um, the barriers are extremely low, and uh, but uh, if they if we talk about photojournalism, then uh, then to stay within it is difficult, and that has to do with being able to make a living. I think we should stop this whole nonsense about expensive equipment. I know how much a camera costs, but I also know people that work with very affordable cameras and get wonderful results and make a, a, a very good living. Um, it's it's expensive to maintain your equipment, uh, of course. Um, but again, uh, the prices have gone gone down, and we should not be tricked by the camera manufacturers anymore that we should buy this new camera. It is not about the camera; it's about the photo that you make and the story that you tell. I never ask a writer what kind of uh, brand of computer he works on or what kind of fountain pen he or she wants to use. Um, so, and it is also, uh, the equipment is, is uh, because it becomes smaller and uh, better, it also becomes lighter, right? So this whole uh, discussion about heavy equipment is uh, to me, yes, of course, if you bring a lot, then it's going to be uh, heavy, but in general, you can travel now with, uh, with very uh, lightweight cameras even the lenses are uh, probably the, the, the heaviest part of it, but also are not so light. But I think we should stop using that as excuses. Um, I see a lot of photographers that enter into the industry that buy secondhand equipment. And uh, some of you might ask, how many clicks did there go into this camera? Who cares? You know, who cares about the clicks that your camera has made? Maybe it will make a photo that is... Uh, 5% less of uh, quality than you think it should be. 
but that doesn't translate into the into the screen that it's shown on or the the the, the image that is printed uh, in the exhibition or in a festival. So no barriers, but difficult to stay within. And I think that it's difficult to stay within is also a sign of the quality and the level that great photojournalism is executed. Yeah. Um, I think there's lots of barriers. Um, I think it's very expensive to start out as a photographer. I think, yes, people get very distracted by equipment and types of lenses and you can spend much more money than you need to. But I also think to be a competitive photography, photographer in the industry, you need at least a couple of lenses, you need a decent body, you need a laptop. And I think, you know, for people from poorer countries or poorer people in richer countries, it's, it's a lot of money to start out and you're not necessarily making a huge amount of money when you start. Um, so I think people with money or people that can live with their parents or have support from somewhere else are a, a huge advantage to other people. It's very interesting. I, yeah. <laughs> you both have a very different with Last, you, you want to answer something? Uh, I have a story. I, I think I, I, I don't argue against you, Anna, because I know that that this is a fact. People with, so this is one of the barriers. If you don't have, uh, if you have less money than somebody else, it's difficult, more difficult to get in. Um, and, um, but it's not just uh, young people that, with rich parents that get into this industry. Um, I'd like to always use a, a story. I, I went to Ghana with World Press Photo. I have many friends there in, in photography. And I met a photographer who had literally taped a, a Canon uh, a professional camera together. Uh, and I said, uh, how can you work with this? He said, because it's still working. I mean, it, the outside looks off awful. And uh, But he worked for NGOs. And... Um, and he, he was doing well. Actually, I had a funny discussion with him because he complained uh, in a session just like this, but then uh, in, a, in a space in, in Accra and that he would only get 50 euros uh, a photo from an NGO because lots of African photographers work for NGOs telling their stories. Uh, good for them because local photographers make that work. And I said, well, congratulations. <laughs> Uh, I said, because last week I was in Portugal and there was a photographer who complained uh, in a, one of, I mean, Europe is rich, Portugal is less rich than, uh, than say other countries maybe, doesn't matter. But I said, congratulations, because this Portuguese photographer was getting 25 euros for the photo that he was taking. So there's so much nuance to this that we should be uh, careful to, um, to, to, to talk about um, uh, some of the examples, I mean, just as Anna speaks rightly so about photographers with lots of money or rich parents to get in, we also should talk about my friend in uh, Ghana who enters into it with a very crappy looking camera, but is uh, actually basically working on the same level as, as, as others do, are doing. Um, it's a difficult, it's a big, simple question to ask, but it's difficult to answer because it depends also on the part of the world that you live. It's, hard, it's easy to get into photojournalism in the Netherlands. It's hard to get into photojournalism in Ghana. Um, so the, all these elements should, we should keep in mind. Uh, yeah. But again, I have so many uh, uh, stories of those who just entered without education, without any money, uh, were able to invest themselves forward and are in two years' time but having a great, great business. And not a business that they become filthy rich, but just a, a very, very steady business in which they could sustain themselves and the family. Uh, and it's very remarkable. Uh, you can go to the USA and get a photo education. It will take you three or four years and you will pay probably uh, $70,000. I think it's become totally ridiculous. Uh, so we should scrap away a lot of these uh, silly investments. Um, and think in, the, think in, the, in a new way about it and see if we can, if we can change this, um, this notion of uh, cost level and necessities that we need. 
um, yeah. Can I just address one thing? Yes. <laughs> for, the, for the heavy equipment, I've never had a problem carrying photography equipment. Any female photographers that I've worked with or have met have never had any problem carrying equipment. The problem seems to be in the mind of other people worrying about other people that they're potentially hiring. So no. I don't think it's ever been a realistic problem. No. It's just it's, a preconception of a problem and yeah. a reason not to hire certain kind of people. It, it says a lot about the person that's, that speaks about it in that way and not so much about the person that is making the work. So yeah, I, I agree, Anna. Yeah. There's no such thing as a, a heavy equipment, yeah. And how would you um, convince the people who are thinking about having this prejudice to change their mind that uh, those are not the barriers, those are not the, the problem to, to be a good full photographer? Mm. The good thing about dinosaurs is that they die out. Um, but it sometimes takes quite a long time. Uh, and then we uh, still dig them up to look at them maybe to learn something or I don't know. It takes, I think a lot of things are changing in the industry, to be honest. Uh, unfortunately, I also, I, we talk a lot about professional photographers having a hard time. Well, let's talk about photo editors or directors of photography that have a hard time. They are all being pushed out of the industry. We've now come to a point that they don't want to pay much for photography, but they also think they can do without a director of photography, which is the silliest thing I've ever heard of. If everything becomes visual, why would you shy away from the professionals that know everything about visuals? So it says, uh, it says a lot about the industry um, and also probably where you don't want to go anymore. But uh, luckily, the persons that talk like that are also uh, losing their positions uh, very rapidly because there is no way that uh, organizations can allow uh, internally people to talk about it like that. It will go slow and... These remnants will certainly remain, but uh, yeah, it, it does change. Thank you. Can I invite um, the audience to ask some questions? I know today we have quite a lot of you staying on here. It would be good to also to, if you don't have questions, you can also share also the challenges you face as a photojournalist, or even I know that there are quite a lot of uh, journalist unions. Um, an association representative here, and maybe also share how you could help uh, as an organization, photojournalists to overcome this, um, all those challenges and barriers that we, we mentioned and what you are doing at your national level on this. Do I see any hands or questions in the chat box? Can I say something? Yes. <laughs> I, I thank you all for this. Uh, event. It's, uh, it's very good for, for us. I, I'm João from Portugal, from the Portuguese Union, and um, I, I, I will just paint a, a black portrait, a little one. Uh, in, in Portugal, we have, um, I, I think the, the, the major factor is we are not united. Uh, in, in Portugal, uh, the, the photographer who takes less is uh, worth more. And if we think this for, for ourselves, uh, the, the guys that will employ us will think that too, because they want to, to, to pay much for the, the pictures and the, um, and the photographs. Uh, Lars was saying that uh, a Portuguese photographer was uh, uh, getting 25 euros per photo, and it's not that, it's 25 euros per work, uh, maybe three, four, five, six hours of work, and uh, he only goes uh, with 25 euros uh, home. It's uh, with, with a, a freelance uh, buying the equipment and uh, the computers and etc. It's uh, few, few, few uh, money to, to work with. But I, I like the positivity that uh, Anna and Lars were uh, pressing uh, with, this, uh, with this talk. And I agree that uh, professionalism and uh, love for the for the work maybe will uh, render us some uh, some more earnings. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you all. If if you uh, yeah, thank you, Joao. And I, I think you're right. It was about the work, and uh, the, the 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 story is from already uh, let's say a couple of years back. 
so it might have changed uh, again if I, I i maybe you've noticed it in the last hour my passion and love for photojournalism is uh, big but i also like to push back a little bit and take uh, away some of the assumptions or the notions or i try to battle off um i, I let's say i support positive thinking and uh, try to shy away from uh, negative negativism uh, negative thinking because i don't think it's going to bring us uh, that much it's always very tempting to talk about paradise lost but we should talk about uh, bright futures ahead of us um, given still re realizing very much that it's not easy and uh, financially it's not easy and I agree that these investments are uh, are, are large, and uh, so maybe we should be smart about it. I saw that somebody posted uh, that people uh, rent stuff, right? Well, you have to have your basic equipment, but uh, sometimes renting is the new buying. You don't always need certain things uh, to to have with you, but uh, it's good to have uh, at least the basics in place. And and but even that is is very expensive. You know, computer is expensive and uh, a camera is expensive, especially if you want to bring your work to a level where you feel that uh, uh, equipment is beneficial to it. Yeah. Um, can I say one word, please? Yes. yes. I work, I edit a few websites that deals with journalism and I work with an agency. The agency gets a monthly payment. Now that gives me a key to a website with thousands of uh, photos that I can take uh, hot stories, take from them as long as I keep paying them or the organization I work for as an editor keeps paying them their monthly rate. So the lone photographer might be in, a, in, in a trouble these days, but when he's becoming part of an agency, that knows how to protect his rights. It's it's something that gives him more stability. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? I can see also some of your shares of some of your work. I, I can see one of the participant, Evelyn, share about a research paper on the relations of photo editors and photo amateurs. So it touched upon uh, something that we talked about and we mentioned about. Do I have more questions from some of you or some comment? I see a hand, Simon. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm from the NUJ uh, in the UK. Um, I know, I, we've got um, a photographer's council sort of um, advisory group within the union um, to advise the rest of the union on our issues. And I suppose the two major issues are sort of low fees and unfair contracts, um, mm -hmm. which isn't actually unique to photographers or unfair contracts affecting other members of the union, you know, uh, including writers, et cetera. But um, yeah, there's, a, there's always kind of pressure to give up rights, you know, to um, particularly in commission work, but um, there's all kinds of, ways that you know <clears throat> publishers and, and users just try and use work for nothing or, or use or use it very extensively for you know a one-off fee um so one of our priorities is, is to look at unfair contracts um in conjunction with other parts of the union and hopefully wider too um and also to try and get more rights for freelance and atypical workers um you know, people doing regular shifts should have rights to sort of approaching those of you know employed um, because the companies you know using freelancers regularly are basically avoiding employing people um, as staff um, we've also got issues in the uk with safety but we can come on a uh, safety of journalists and including photographers we can come on to that tomorrow mm -hmm. thanks Thank you, Simon, um, for mentioning about these uh, issues. And, and I know the NUJ has a lot of work um, on these issues. And so as also some of the EFJ members um, some uh, who also work on this issue about payment rates and also 
um, the buyout, the issue about buyout con contracts and the uses of image. Um, and tomorrow we will also have a specific session really on union actions and, and campaigns for photojournalists. But maybe we can touch a little bit on this. Um, since last you mentioned before at the beginning that you have um, various idea about monetizing um, um, money photographs. So when it comes to issue, you know, you sell your, your picture, you try to negotiate, but uh, on the other side, because we all know that most photojournalists work alone like a freelance. So when you're trying to negotiate with the big fish, uh, the publisher, how do you make sure that you don't lose out? How do you gain the edge? Um, do you have some advices on this? Because I think this is uh, often the case for photojournalists and also freelance journalists when they try to negotiate. It's difficult to, to face with the big corporations. Um, do you have some advices? Yeah. Negotiating hard is, uh, is, is important. Um, I mean, at the end, it's about somebody wanting, wanting something from you and hopefully something from you specifically, whether it's your quality or your uniqueness or the value that you uh, bring to the table. Um, I mean, there, in media, some photographers never negotiate and make a decent fee but you never hear them because they don't want to share it with their competitors or colleagues, whatever you want to call it. They, they, uh, I, I know examples of photographers that have very high fees and still are in the picket line when there's protests for low fees because they show solidarity, which is a great thing. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, as much as, uh, as difficult as it is, there is always the power of saying no um, if it's too low, it's too low. If it if you work at a loss, then you should be working there. I mean, then you're covering your losses and you're not uh, covering your your income. Um, so negotiation is is always one and and talk. Yeah. One of the advices that I would say is we always talk about price and never on value proposition. You will always be beaten on the price. Because there's always somebody that will work for less or is cheaper or there's an agency that sells photos uh, in buckets full for a very slow, uh, low amount of number. So if you are able to, I mean, the reason that they invite you to talk about working for them is the fact that they are interested in you, which means that it has a certain value for you. So start talking about the value that you bring to the table instead of the price. Uh, never start with uh, talking about price. Always talk about the things that you, you bring to the table. Or ask them, why did you ask me to come over and, and talk about it? Because then they have to explain to you that they believe in your work and they think it's interesting and they would like to work with you. And then this negotiation about uh, fees will always be there. Um, yeah, the contracts that they give you are uh, totally uh, uh, out of line. You know, they, they buy one thing of you and they keep using it uh, forever. As long as this kind of media exists, they will continue to do so. Um, so I would say uh, that that's also part of negotiation. Yes, you can work with me and maybe you pay not so much, but then certainly you don't pay uh, for uh, perpetual use. So there's many levels in, uh, in the conversation uh, that you have. Some of you are always afraid to negotiate because they might be angry at me. Well, uh, yeah, they, 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 I don't think so. Uh, but very often we assume things and we don't validate them. So show them from the start that you talk about price later on. You know, Talk about the value that you have, that you don't work for a certain price because you're better than that. Um, but for me, the biggest uh, advice would be to make sure that you have a diversified portfolio. Uh, if you work for only one uh, uh, organization that is assigning you, then you become very vulnerable. And I've seen it so many times in the past that photographers work for a certain type of newspaper or magazine and suddenly the magazine folds or goes totally online and off you go or new generation comes in and they want to work with new people. 
Um, so a diversified portfolio of working for also clients that Anna talked about, not necessarily is in just in media, but also is beyond it. That makes you also a living. I guess that's where you have to realize that uh, these media uh, titles are certainly not the only clients that you should have. Um, yeah, but that's more like a business decision. And also, uh, this is also where you should work on uh, your business development. Thanks, Lars. I, I, so, yeah, so just sorry, sorry to interrupt you, your plan. It is very often that I talk to photographers that, uh, and I, I, I ask them then many questions. Who are you? How many followers do you have on, in, on social media, whether it's Instagram or even, I mean, uh, TikTok? whatever you want. Uh, do you have a website? Is everything in good shape? Uh, uh, how many followers do you have? It is very often very easy to connect to them and say, if you, you might think about this or you might think about that. If you have a lot of fans, then to transfer, the fans are there because they value you. And because they value you, you can also work with them and see if, if, if they can do something for you. Um, and it's very often very easy for me to look at work and to, uh, at a certain type of photographer to identify other sources of income. Uh, I, I typed accidentally in the chat the, the name of uh, Mataja Krivic from Slovenia, who told me when he won World Press Photo, I, uh, I make uh, three euros a photo now. And I was like, how, how can we make sure that a uh, World Press Photo winner uh, is able to make a living? And uh, one of the good things is that he got lots of recognition and his, uh, uh, his followers uh, grew. And uh, two years ago, I spoke with him for an hour about business model. And um, I gave him the idea. I said, how many people do follow you? Why don't you offer them uh, a special print during the end of the year? Um, and he, uh, he offered a print, small size, unlimited edition, 150 euro uh, piece. And he sold uh, in one month for 25,000 euros worth of prints. And you could say, yeah, this print should have been paid for on a large size, uh, 5,000 euros. But it's very rare that people do it. But be, to, to make sure that he went into his um, fans and his followers and said, here you go. I have something wonderful. You can have it. Uh, you can buy it now for 150 euros. Uh, lots of people did it, and it, it was the biggest paycheck in five years. I never got anything of it. They didn't give me even. He didn't even give me a print. Uh, I don't want to. I said to him, "Don't give me a print because it's worth 150, and I can buy it of you." But very often, uh, I can identify these uh, specific. Uh, abilities to do it um, a thousand fans that spend a hundred euros on you every year i'm not going to do the math a thousand fans that spend a hundred euros on you every year if you can achieve that you don't need this stupid media you don't need this newspaper you don't need that uh, magazine that gives you a shitty fee then you use the media as well to also make sure that they know about you um so this is a the battle between collective thinking which we all should do and egoistic thinking where it's like okay i still have to make a living out of this how can i achieve this um yeah so just an, a simple example that would probably apply to all of you thanks Lars, for this uh, this uh, very creative way of um generating business and I think it's also point to the fact that uh, with your passions ability to make good photographs photojournalists also need to think outside the box beyond beyond photojournalism to to for the personal branding and also to find new um, business uh, revenue so uh, I think we are almost uh, we still have like five minutes um, I would like to ask if anyone have more questions or comments or information to share please uh, raise your hand or put your question
do I do I understand that um, our colleague Natasha from uh, NUJ is here and would like to to ask the question related to the disability issue that we we raised before. Um, hi, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm late to the conversation, the kids are on half term, which is uh, why I'm a bit late. Um, it's just um, interesting to kind of consider the experiences of um, disabled photographers. So I know certainly for me, um, the kind of direction I've gone with my photography has been shaped by the fact that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a woman, but I'm a disabled woman as well. Um, and so I work with a lot of clients who who benefit from having somebody working with them and with their members who have that lived experience and that that connection um, to understand how you can represent people's stories in a way that is authentic, accurate um, uh, and, and kind of gives people the dignity of having their voice heard in, in the way that they need to. But it does also restrict me in terms of, um, so for example, I do sometimes do news photography. Um, I've, I've worked on election campaigns, um, but I'd be reluctant to put myself into a public order kind of environment where I can't hear what's going on around me, um, where, uh, you know, I, my, my safety would be at a greater risk and possibly I would endanger other people in the process. Um, so, so I do find it interesting to um i don't know whether anybody else here um sort of has experienced any of those kind of restrictions in terms of their own careers but i've also found my niche because i'm a disabled photographer um and actually i i find my work incredibly fulfilling um i feel that i offer something that's different um and um i benefit from that and so so do other people um so so that that was kind of the perspective that i wanted to put forward on that one Right. Yeah, good to hear. Yeah, thanks, Natasha, for sharing this uh, positive uh, story about uh, resilience and also um, finding your, your, your turning your disadvantage into your advantage. Um, and I think that's very um, admirable. I don't know if any more questions um, for the speakers or any comment or also experience to share from the from the from the audience. If not, um, I would uh, like to conclude today's uh, sessions by asking one final question um, uh, to the two speaker. So we talk about a lot about the challenges, opportunities, and then also the business side of photojournalism. So if there's a, a young um, a young person, uh, either a prospective uh, photojournalist or, or someone who just entered the industry. So what advice would you give them, um, given that we discuss all these challenges, all these barriers, um, what advice would you give um, this person? Anna or Lars? Um, I would say I think it's very important when you're starting out and throughout your career to think about the ethics of what you're doing and where your red lines are and what you don't want to do. Um, I would think about the people you're photographing and the consequences for them of having their images published. Um, I would diversify your business and start out because I too have seen photographers that have had one client for years and years and then for some reason that client's gone under I'd say three at least so and it gives you a power as well because if people are cutting your day rate or asking you to do things you're not comfortable with you feel in a much more comfortable position to walk away because you've still got two other clients that would be my advice Oof, I have lots of uh, yeah. Be uh, I would say to them, don't think that this. Uh, don't believe. Uh, don't believe lots of things that you hear about photojournalism, the good and maybe the bad things. Um, persistence will be the biggest thing. You go into it; it's not going to be easy. If you don't believe in it and you're not passionate about it, then then forget about it. You're not going to be able to make it because there's so many passionate people in it. Um, and they will continue no matter what. Uh, 
what I would suggest is uh, using uh, places like this where we are together now, which I always enjoy much because I can share some of my uh, knowledge, my insights, uh, and I can also push a little bit uh, to, for people to think beyond uh, boundaries and to be optimistic. But uh, one of the beautiful things in photography compared to other creative industries is that there's a big willingness to come together and share information. Uh, you don't see that very often at uh, whether it's in design or in architecture, where it's very much often at a level where it's more like a conference. While in photography and in uh, photojournalism, uh, lots of people are there to help you out. So um, be aware of that. And um, but that that will continue to count on on every age. There's so much information and good uh, things to share with each other in. Uh, in this in this part of the industry that uh, we should cherish that uh, and uh, and and uh, and build on that you know? and uh, i would say all the organizations that do well um, it's not very often that people now say hooray for the unions uh, we're all struggling i've been in a uh, you know working with the union or for a union myself if we don't create value for each other then why would we ever be part of it but it shows that uh, we're all here and it means that uh, that it works so let's continue to do that as well yeah. connect yourself and be persistent that would be my advice thank you so I, much Lass. sorry I'd, I'd also say photograph what you love i think that makes a huge difference yeah yeah thank you anna and thank you Lass, so much for sharing your variable experiences and also your thoughts about um, the industry and the future. And um, very positive, um, we ended in a very positive notes uh, despite all these challenges that we discussed. And obviously tomorrow we will continue our discussions uh, to, to focusing on more on the safety of photojournalists, um, also on the legal challenges. And also you mentioned about last, also the union, also the role of uh, journalist union associations. What can they do to bring together the photojournalists and provide support for each other and sharing experiences and good practices. So thank you everyone for um, coming here. And uh, I hope to see, um, see you tomorrow at the same time online here. Thank you. Bye -bye. Well done. Bye bye. Well done, Yuglan. Thank you for the hosting this and, and uh, working uh, with this on, on this with us. Yeah, well done. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Gotcha,